During the latter half of the 20th century, a lot about the world has changed, and the issues that we face today, such as climate change, dwindling energy supplies, and global food security, are both unprecedented and pose perhaps the greatest challenge that we've ever had to face as mankind. I'm here today with Professor Lord Robert May of Oxford, who has had an illustrious career in science, both within academia and beyond. He's held posts at Harvard, Princeton and Oxford universities, as well as having been the UK government's chief scientific advisor. Let's hear what he's got to say. Good afternoon, Lord May. How now? So, um, what, what would you say the biggest issues that we face as a civilization today are? We have a tendency to pick an issue at a time. If you'd asked me that 30, 40 years ago, we'd probably have said uh, population. If you asked me today, I'd probably say climate change. Yeah. But in fact, there's an interlocking set of issues. This is Darwin College, we're recording this. You go back 150 years to origin of species, yeah. The population in that 150 years, the world's population has increased sevenfold, and the ecological footprint, or energy consumption per person on average, has increased sevenfold. So the impact we have is 50-fold, and that's a combination of too many people consuming too much energy, putting, burning a million years' worth of fossil fuel each year, putting carbon back into the atmosphere, climate change, and intersecting with all of that, thus our problems of feeding tomorrow's world with our pressures on the water supply and the disruption of habitats creating new diseases, the intermingling and moving, helping the revival of old diseases. We have a concatenation of problems that I think it's unhelpful to think of one at a time, even though it's understandable. Okay, so the underlying problem appears to be too many people. Perhaps. It's too many people and too much impact per person. It's not one or the other, it's both. Yeah. Okay, so what, what, what may we do to, to solve this problem? I mean, we can't necessarily slow down population growth. If that's well, we need... One can do things, and they're often politically incorrect things. If China had not acted as it has to slow down population growth, it would be heading for two billion round about now. There are things you can do, and there are things equally you can do to inhibit people thinking about it. You can run round in Africa, as the Vatican has energetically been doing, telling lies about the ineff inefficiency of condoms in preventing the transmission of HIV because you have an ideology that says uh, more and more people is good. There are lots of things you can be doing about each of these problems, but almost all of the things you could be doing uh, are not necessarily in, in the interest of individual people or individual groups of people. You have tensions between what is the interest of the community and what is the interest of the individual. Okay. And so on the, on the aspect of individuals, what, what could individuals do? I mean, we hear a lot about how we could, you know, small things we could each do, turn off the lights, you know, reduce the amount of water we use, not, not perhaps buy so much, but is, would this have a real... Of real course effect? it has a real effect, yes. And in fact, some countries are... Much, I could give you the statistics for, I haven't had to be aware of for one of the major banks as to what is the ecological footprint, energy consumption rather, per person, employee, in different countries. Okay. That varies by a full order of magnitude. So part, and that's not just living standard, that's partly the habits of behaviour, cultural things. The real problem goes back to da Darwin's great, still unsolved problem of how did we evolve, as we have so successfully, societies in which people cooperate, often making small sacrifices individually for the good of the whole. Yep. If we're small bands of hunter-gatherers, as we were for most of our history, we're all related to each other, so you can explain it. But that general problem of the evolution of cooperation, of why each prairie dog takes its turn giving an alarm call to risk, which is a much greater net benefit to the colony, yes. in, and is not destroyed, apparently, by cheating prairie dogs taking the benefit without paying the cost. That's because they're all related. But once we got to be complicated, it's harder to understand. It may well be that many of our 
systems of belief and the origins of, of religion very positively was a kind of glue, a belief in an all-seeing, all-wise individual that it was just as well to be on the good side of, um, was a powerful mechanism for helping create the complex societies we have. But until we have a much better understanding of what binds us together yes. and, and what created our institutions of cooperation, it's very hard to see how we'll overcome the resistance for I will if you will, dissolving into I won't because you won't. Yes, yes. So we've got, if we have an atheist society that is segregated into the separate countries and separate communities, that's gonna, that is fundamentally going to make things harder. Not necessarily. If we've no. got a set of fundamentalist religious communities each in, separated into various okay. things. So if, if, as long as we've got at the level of individuals or the level of communities a focus on the close and the individual and a failure to recognise that ultimately that's going to be a cost to them as the as part of as the, the whole. part of the whole, uh, we have a problem that we're not dealing with very well. Climate change is a perfect example of this. Is yeah. that if you just look at the major divide between the haves and the have-nots, most of the carbon that's up there and causing the problem already, 80% or more of it, was put up there by the OECD countries. Yes. And yet many of them insist they're not going to do anything until the develop, developing countries start to do something. An equitable trajectory, the one the UK is committed to, Climate Change Committee's recommendations that the government's accepted, yes. asks, by 2050, what's got to be the carbon footprint per person around the globe, yes. which everyone has, and that would mean the UK is going to aim, is aiming to go down to that, while China and India, one recognises, will come, albeit we hope more slowly, up to that okay. and not overshoot it. And that means different things, different places. We're, but there are some countries whose insistence is we're not doing anything until this and, or that or the other country. So the, the, there is a lack of cooperation, perhaps. Yeah, and it's understandable. Yeah, because, because if, if we have a segregated society, then there's no particular reason why you would trust... Well, in, 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 in a certain sense, there's no reason why you would trust somebody else to reciprocate if you made the first move. It's sort of some sort of... Maybe some sort of stalemate. It's a general um, problem. Yeah. It's a problem... I mean, if you take a more immediate example, uh, how should we reform the banking system so that we realise all the many benefits it delivers without the system fragility that it manifestly has. Yes. There's a tension of interest there because the way the banking system works at the moment is just great for the banks. Yes. And the focus of each bank is on it and its employees and the money they take home. But ultimately, you want a system that has paid deliberate attention, often at the expense of the behaviour of individual banks, for the stability of the system as a whole. Indeed. But there are understandable tensions there. They're all around you in any context you care to look at. Okay. So in your, in your role um, in the UK government's Climate Change Committee, um, what, what's, what's the sort of current state of affairs? How much do we know? Um, and do we have any chance of, of solving the problem or making incremental steps toward well, there's no solving the problem? First of all, it's unfortunate that the general understanding of what science is, we tend to get from primary school, secondary school, even university, as science is presented quite sensibly as a set of things we really know. That's how else could you organise the syllabus and on quiz shows and want to be a millionaire. You can't have ambiguity about the answers to no. the questions. But at a real science, at the frontier is a journey of discovery, and on any subject, and climate change is no exception, it was fairly clear in broad outline a hundred years ago what was happening, but we only had the computational power to begin to flesh, flesh that out in detail beginning 30, 40 years ago and getting better all the time. Even now, there are uncertainties about the speed of certain complicated nonlinear processes. Shall, what if... What if uh, tundra thaws and methane's rela released. Uh, um, what is actually the speed of the, mel of the melting of glaciers? There's, there's quite a few elements of significant uncertainty in the time scale of processes, but there's no longer any significant uncertainty into the fact that the massive 
amounts of fossil fuel carbon we're putting up into the atmosphere, which are carrying us to a thickening of the greenhouse gas yes. blanket that hasn't been seen for tens of millions of years, and when it was last seen, ended up when the oceans equilibrated, which itself takes centuries, uh, had the oceans about 100 metres higher. That's not going to happen in anyone's lifetime or even anyone's grandchildren's lifetime, but that's what we're committing ourselves to. And it's very hard to take that on board when the daily weather fluctuates so much. Yes. It's very hard to confuse, it's very easy to confuse how high the next breaking wave is going to wash up the beach with the movements of the tides. Yeah. And many people focus on the tiny details of local events. Indeed. Weather is different from climate. Indeed. And um, when it snows, we have people saying, uh, it can't yeah, be climate exactly. change. That's right. um, so, but, so it's a fact. And we are doing some effective things about it. We need to be doing them faster and more yes. consistently. But there are feasible trajectories to coming to a globally equitable solution sometime around the middle of the century. Whether we'll get there is another question altogether. So there are trajectories, there are some ideologies in place that we, we, we could follow that would at least help us you know, some, get to all yeah, There's some to technical trajectory, lots of things we could do, but yeah. okay. it requires everyone to be doing it. Okay. And would <laughs> we're, you making say a good, we're making a good start in lots of ways. It's a, interesting and complicated things. There are a few countries who have done better than Britain in the intellectual leadership and the recognition of the problem. But even there, interestingly, there are other countries in Europe who, while they don't even have the legislative framework we now have, yes, yes. are nonetheless doing a better job of actually getting things done because okay. they're more comfortable with a form that could be unkindly characterised as command and control yes. rather than seeking... Um, liberal fiscal instruments. Yes, so, yes. And then thus, they may be behind us in the rhetoric, but they're ahead of us in the action. Okay. But okay. The, the, the signs are not unhopeful. Yeah. Talking about um, something that you're uh, quite, quite interested in and have been involved in for a long time, in infectious diseases and, and epidemics, um, what, what would you say the sort of current state of affairs is with regards to that? So are we, are we facing any problems? Are there anything, is there anything sort of lurking that we should be well, concerned about? I think of all the problems we're facing, oddly enough, this is the one that worries me least. Infectious that, diseases. Yes, that's right. And why is that? It's not that there aren't going to be an increasing number of problems arising because the combination of more people and more interactions, more disturbance of other animals, the internationalization of what was once a small scale cultural habit of eating bushmeat, yeah. the globalization of that to, to deal, I mean, SARS was the product of commercialization of bushmeat to serve posh, exotic animal restaurants in southern China. Yes. Now, there's going to be more things happen, but why am I optimistic against that? The increasing understanding we have at a still accelerating rate that re reaching down to the molecular machinery of life itself is still a long way off giving us a complete understanding of the immune system. Okay. I mean, most of, uh, many of my molecular biological colleagues are doing unimaginably clever things in characterizing the molecular machinery, what's going on, but at the same time, very many of them don't realize that they still don't understand actually uh, the somatic details of how the immune system assembles itself in the first few years of life. Okay. Why doesn't it go on a bit longer? Why doesn't it go on a bit shorter? Is the hygiene hypothesis about the rise of allergies associated with not challenging it enough by playing in the dirt when you're little? Yeah, is yeah. that right or is that rubbish? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Are the allergies an epiphenomenon of the immune system in its years of early assembly uh, not being challenged enough and looking for an inappropriate work to do? That, that's an interesting example of the fact that our extraordinary brilliant understanding of elements of the molecular machinery that enable us to keep drug, make drugs that keep people infected with HIV alive while we still don't understand the pathogenesis of HIV in, in yes. detail. Yes. Uh, I, the, the texts of immunology today are still 
brilliantly descriptive, complicatedly descriptive, but they're still more they're still more like ecology in the fifties, which was description of what happens in the outside world, yes, yes. rather than the striving to an understanding of the complicated dynamics of nonlinear systems of many entities. But I, I'm sure that's changing, and I, my, I believe, and this is why I'm optimistic about this element, yes. I'd say the ecology, the immunology texts of 20, 30 years from now will look quite different. And 20, 30 years from now, we'll be able to give you really good answers, I believe, to the question how usefulness, how useful will a generic vaccine against flu be? Okay. Um, questions like that so that we'll be able to respond quicker, more accurately, we'll be able to produce vaccines quicker. That is one thing where I think our increasing mastery, the external world, is going to give unambiguously good consequences. Hence your lack so of worry. I, yeah, so that, that's the le least of my worries because okay. that's one where although I see the problems increasing, I do see a feasible, plausible, technological answer. Yes. And that's not quite the same as what do you do about the ocean rising. Yes. That's not nearly so easy. And the idea that you can geoengineer your way around it scares the devil out of me because we've got to this situation by doing things without thinking of unintended consequences and chucking all sorts of stuff into the ocean, and, for example, to see if we can modify the way it behaves does yeah. seem to me a very dangerous thing to be doing. Okay. So is it something to do with the fact that the, the biological system is in a lot smaller scale, something we can deal with, whereas the, the climate change is a, a many-body well, well, basically, system. I would say uh, the molecular biological understanding of individual viruses interacting with individual immune system cells, for all its brilliance and technical description, is just a hell of a lot easier than these other larger scale nonlinear processes where it's much harder to bring them into lab. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's been extremely. Uh, I'll tell you what, before I go away, I'll yeah, just say, no, well, no, we've got, we've got is, none of this is what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> this is the, the Darwin series on beauty. And I made, the, I made what may well have been the mistake of agreeing to give the first talk on beauty and mathematics because I thought it'd be an interesting challenge. Yes. Um, and it is true that the talk I'm going to give is going to stray as much and away from beauty and mathematics as this interview is yes, <laughs> from yes. beauty and mathematics. But I am going to try and say there's a difference between mathematics as such, where much of it, you can really prove things. Yes, you, know, yes. you make the assumptions, it's theorem, another lemma, yes, axiom, yes, lemma, yes. theorem, proof. Science itself is more contingent journey. Um, and I'm going to try and talk about things like that, but I'm also going to try and persuade people that mathematics is beautiful. It is beautiful. Brilliant.